Welcome to the Time for a Reset podcast, the podcast where I, Paul Frampton, interview senior marketeers on the big issues of the day and the thing that they want to see reset uh, with an ever-changing landscape. Welcome back to another episode of Time for a Reset. This morning, I'm delighted to be joined by Chris Carter. Chris is Marketing and E-Commerce Director for UK, Ireland and Spain for Specsavers. Chris has had a illustrious career, um, agency side, and then moved into Specsavers um, and has worked on both the trading side, the marketing side, and these days looks after both marketing and the e-commerce side. So um, very well um, kind of experienced to be able to have the conversation that we're going to have today. So welcome this morning, Chris. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to have you here. So as you know, uh, we always start um, our first question for our guests um, around the topic of what you would personally like to hit reset on within the marketing space. So um, maybe you could share with us uh, your answer. Yeah, sure. So I think for me, uh, what do I want to hit reset on? Uh, I want to uh, try and rebalance um, the uh, or strike a better balance between the what and the and the how. Uh, and I suppose what I mean by that is um, trying to spend less time on uh, crafting uh, the plan, the marketing plan in this case, and a lot more time in actually uh, how my team, how my department and how our partner agencies work together um, to deliver solutions. Um, I guess a lot of that comes from the, the experiences we've had over, the, over, over this year so far. Um, we were forced into a position, as I'm sure many were, to sort of ditch their marketing plans um, in the early part of the year. So for us, around mid-March, we decided to, to scrap it. And um, I guess in doing that, that could have been quite intimidating for our department, for our teams, without the framework and without this plan that had been crafted over the last six months. But we, we actually sort of saw the opposite. It seemed to, it seemed to liberate people. There was, there was more of a culture of, of empowerment, collaboration, the guys going the extra mile. And they were doing all of that, um, I suppose, with an added level of stress because of the times we were living through. Uh, and an unfamiliar environment as well, because everyone was working from home rather than in the office. Yeah. Uh, and just got me got me thinking really that actually uh, the, the way we work together and the way that our teams work together uh, arguably is much more important than the plan that we choose to put down on the page at the start of each year. I love that. Um, and I think we've all heard some horror stories about um, the stress levels that people are under, the mental health uh, challenges and the need to get stuff done but it sounds like you guys managed to strike the right balance in terms of almost liberating the team um, to, to think differently were there were there particular behaviors that you identified that you focused on um, trying to work uh, to help the team to move towards or, or did it just kind of happen organically and like week in week out you just tried to follow how things were kind of playing out because obviously you didn't have that plan but I'd, I'd love yeah. to hear a bit more about it because guests would right really benefit from understanding that story yeah I think I think since we've post rationalized some of that um and it might be worth touching on that in a, in a moment around around behaviors but I think at the time because of how quickly things were changing um a lot of it happened organically I, I think I think there are a few sort of principles to start established quite early within the business. So uh, from, you know, from the, from the managing director to, to the UK board, which I sat on, and then obviously to my, to my team within, within UK marketing. And some of the examples of that were uh, around um, people being empowered to make decisions in the moment uh, and to get those, get those yeah. decisions, uh, to get those decisions um, uh, wrong from time to time. Um, I think another key one was around just focusing on, on one goal each day or one goal each week uh, and, um, and disregarding everything else. Um, and also then undoing, undoing the plan and trying to stop as much, uh, as much sort of superfluous work and activity as we could. And I think, I think those sorts of principles really helped um, motivate and focus the minds and give a clear direction to the, to the team. Um, which really started to to engender, I think, maybe how people felt a bit more liberated and a, and a clear sort of goal to strive towards, despite obviously the massive uncertainty that was um, uh, that was going on at the time. Sure. So it sounds like ruthless 
prioritization on what actually matters and trying to um, not do too many things in a week and allowing people to what is often called fail fast. Um, how do you actually make sure that that fail fast, um, make, make, make decisions and take some risks actually doesn't get, people don't get scolded if it does create a mistake? Because I, I hear lots of companies talk about, yeah, we have a value or behavior of encouraging fail fast, but the reality is when you talk to their employees, quite often they say, well, actually when we have done that, we don't necessarily think the company allows that space face so what is it that you do as a leader or the company does to try and actually in encourage the learning that comes out of failure yeah i think um so i i, th I think we're, we're definitely on a journey with that i wouldn't say we're there we're, sure. we've, we're, we've we've perfected it but i think what i think what's really important is first of all to be sort of modeling those behaviors as a as a leader across the business um but also ensuring there's a there's a safe environment in which to do it and I think certainly with the amount of activity that we will tend to, to tend to activate um, across channels over the course of the year, uh, and, and given the environment we were in certainly over the course of the summer, I think there are there are certain opportunities that present themselves where actually, you know, the um, uh, the the consequences of of, of failure of, of something not working, you know, are, are actually pretty uh, are pretty small. And so I think just finding those right yeah. environments to be able to then champion success and failure to the whole department as well um, is, um, is, is a great opportunity. And then just ensuring you communicate it as well. So I think over communication at the time, and I guess that's probably one of the key things we've tried to hold on to since, uh, since the springtime is also really important. So people actually understand when, they, when, you know, when, um, when these experiences are taking place and, and, and the wins and the losses that are, that are happening across the department or across the business. Yeah, this, 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 this thought of the marketing department making sure it communicates um, effectively is one that's come up a few times with guests. Actually, Peter Markey was talking about quite often, actually, you forget to communicate the value of marketing inside an organization because you're so focused on the external. Um, I know we touched on in our pre-chat, Chris, about how you kind of get the board um, and the leadership team to, to come along uh, on the journey with marketing. How, how, how bought in and kind of invested would you say your board is into the value of marketing like per se, but also through, um, through, through this quite challenging period? Um, so I think we've been on a bit of a journey there. So I think they're very much bought in, but I think there's been a few critical changes we've made certainly this year. So I think if I, if I look back over time, you know, we're a privately owned business. The the founders, Doug and Mary, still work in the in the business every day, really passionate about the value that that marketing brings, um, and the and the benefits it brings to the to the brand. So I I think in in that respect, I'm I'm sort of lucky if you like that I'm working in an organisation where that that's sort of inherent in the in the culture. Um, when I think about uh, the last sort of six months, um, I think what that's really shown us is that there is a lot more that we we could be doing to communicate the benefits of, of marketing and actually to um, to communicate some of the great stuff that we do for our customers uh, internally. And I guess the reason I say that is we we launched a campaign in early April um, called Open for Care because we're an essential service provider in the importance of taking a regular eye test. We were able yeah. to stay open. And we just we just started recording these these customer stories um, and we played them out through social um, just to let, let customers know we were still open and, you know, the, the importance of that service. What was I think what we completely underestimated was the sort of galvanizing effect that had for our partners in stores and for our teams that mm. were now working from home rather than in the support offices, because they were seeing yeah. the sort of the purpose of the brand playing out in front of them. And I, and I guess that. You know, it was a it was a morale boost, and I think it was a real incentive to keep pushing and knowing we were doing the right things. And we, when I look back, we have not done enough, I don't think, as a department in telling that story of the benefits we bring um, uh, to the brand in, in, internally. I think we very much focused on, you know, get a campaign prepared and get that out yeah. to consumers and track sort of consumer response, rather than thinking about the narrative. That we need to be um, that that we need to be delivering within our business and, and across the board table too. Would you say would you say that marketing has become more or less important over the last three to five years within Specsavers? Um, I think it's 
I think it's always been uh, important to the business. I would say I would say it's certainly become a lot more important, but in but in sort of different ways over the course of the last 12 months. Yeah. So I think never has it been more important than in than in than in times like this, you know, times of turmoil. And, the, you know, we've heard many times in the past about how, you know, brands that are prepared to invest and to have a voice through through periods of turmoil yeah. or through periods of recession will but will benefit in the longer run. But I think it's also about um, it's also about the role it can play in in motivating, you know, your own employees as well as um, as well as uh, as well as getting customers through the door in in, in our case. Um, and I think a lot of that sort of um, harks back to you know if you've if you've got a campaign or a narrative that really is is true to the purpose of why the brand or the, the you know the business exists in the first place. I think it can have a really a really powerful impact there too. So I, I would say certainly this year it's it's sort of become uh, more more important than ever to to how we uh, to how we run the business. Great, and I think it's a great reminder that actually marketing one of the stakeholders for any marketing should always be your internal audiences, as you say, whether it's your partners or um, kind of head office. Actually, th- th- they're more invested in actually seeing what the communication is from marketing than sometimes the consumers. Yet often <laughs> that it becomes forgotten, doesn't it, as you're actually planning uh, planning it focused on an end consumer. It does, and I think I think the other piece is around some of the hidden stuff that you tend to do as well. So um, uh, certainly for us, we've we've had more of a traditional advertising model over the last last couple of decades that served us really really well, um, and you can rely upon you know the board to to recognise and to and to see the TV advertising, the billboards, the the press advertising. Um, uh, they're less likely to understand, you know, the work you're doing around propensity models yeah. for CRM or CRO testing across the website. And actually, that's a lot of the stuff, certainly for us in the next five to 10 years, that is really going to generate the value. Unless we proactively tell that story, my finance director and my retail mm-hmm. director, are never, you know, they're never going to hear about that. And I think um, it's really important that you're proactively delivering the um i suppose the, the full gamut of, of impact you're going to have on on the effectiveness of of uh, of the marketing spend uh, because if you don't yeah. then uh, really? i think there's a sense that you're always perceived to be the um you know the the creators of of advertising but not necessarily delivering value to the business yeah no i i definitely hear you and th- this there's something quite interesting around the 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 digital space because in some ways the more targeted it becomes the more invisible it becomes versus actually often with the c-level um ceo cfos that there is a, a lean in towards it because it's so accountable and because they can see dashboards and analytics so how how has shifting more towards e-commerce uh, competing against some of the newer online players that are disrupting your sector and an investment in technology and data. How has that how has that changed the way that you run a marketing team and the type of things that are important within uh, what you do? Um, so I think it's uh, it's made us really rethink um, the structure and the skill sets we're going to need for the next five to ten years. That's for sure. So I think the sort of anal- the the sort of uh, analytically minded individuals within the department. I think that we we're seeing a you know, a real uh, a real need for more of that talent. Uh, I think it's becoming increasingly difficult to come by because I, I think uh, all brands and uh, and and, um, and agencies are on that same sort of trajectory. Um, when I think about how that impacts the conversations we'll have around the board table or with partners, I think you're right in that there's a there's a in a sense it becomes easier because you can you can you can make some clear. Um, uh, clear connections between that that investment, particularly on direct response um, media. I think it's it's probably heightened the the need to ensure that um, the business recognises the importance in continuing to invest in brand and continuing to invest in invest in the long term. So I think that's probably wow. become more important than ever in a way. And that that is always a more nuanced conversation because you don't necessarily have. Uh, that the black and white metrics that you do around, um, you know, around some of uh, some of the online investment. So I think that's uh, that that is still a that is still a, a, an ongoing ongoing challenge and important to be able to ca- um, balance the two. I think for us the other big um, big dynamic and big change is as moving from bricks and mortar to not just I guess e-commerce but actually communicating a lot more with our consumers um, 
uh, online generally, both before and after their their visits, is the role that marketing plays yeah. around that that customer experience. Um, I think we've we are yet to really, and I hesitate to use the word omnichannel, but we we we've banded that around in the business um, for many years. We're only really just beginning to to enter that phase now, and actually the role that marketing plays in that customer experience is is probably the um, the, the biggest uh, the, the the biggest conversation we'll be having over the over the next year or two, simply because it impacts so many other parts of our um, of our operating model um, and our and our, yeah. and our and our wider functions. So there's there's a couple of really good points you made there that I want to pick up on. Um, the, one was around brand that the, the I guess the mix between brand and uh, performance marketing, which I'll come back to in a second. The second was more about the, the piece you just touched on, Chris, which was around pre and post kind of visiting a store. Um, now, m- media, I guess, has become, and, and you've obviously had background working in kind of the CRM kind of direct marketing um, space in, in, in prior parts of your career. Media, media with all the data that's collected, your own first party data being able to be plugged into buying platforms and everything else has obviously made, I guess, what media may have been very broad reach. There is now possibilities to find those audiences and talk to them in different ways rather than just through your CRM, your classic email or mobile or whatever else. Do you see that as an opportunity or do you just still see that maybe there's a bit too much potential wastage in trying to use broader media channels to do the job that CRM does? Um, does that make sense as a question? Yeah, I I think we are. Uh, so I think as a business, we're we're still evolving our our CRM offering. So I I think there is I think there's an opportunity there, but I think for us at the moment, um, one of the biggest challenges we have is so we we're a we're a partnership model, which is which is similar to a franchise, but effectively our directors and our stores own own their businesses. Um, the yeah. level of service and the level of customer service that our um, that our store, uh, that our store directors, and that their colleagues deliver is 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 absolutely exemplary. Um, but they're getting busier and busier, and we're asking them to do more and more. And one of the things right. that we we're really keen to do over the next couple of years, whether that be through media, whether that be through through CRM, is is how can we maintain that level of customer service, but actually do some of the heavy lifting for our colleagues in store so that there isn't quite so much that they need to do to to make it such a great experience. We can start to do some of that before a customer even arrives with us. And obviously after they, after they depart as well. So I think, um, I think for us, the focus is around how we can complement and maybe help with um, help our colleagues in store to be able to deliver that experience without asking them to do even more. Um, And and I think media media is is probably a, 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 a part of that, but um, but certainly in the first instance, I think there's a lot more that, um, that we can do through our, um, through our direct engagement with our own customer base first. Yeah, and I guess using, using technology to try and deliver some of that service um, in a personalised way, because I suppose the, the beauty of the partner service is that it's so personal <laughs> and it's difficult to replicate that, but technology is making it more possible to have some of those personalized communications um, pre and post, I guess. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, I think, you know, there are instances where, you know, if you're, if you're asking a, a, a customer to, um, to, to, if you ask a customer a question before they've, before they've arrived in store and they, they, they you know, they choose yeah. to answer that and invest their time on, you know, online. And then you ask them the same question when they, when they get into store, you've, yeah. you've sort of undermined that experience. Yeah. So you're right. We need to complement uh, what happens in store, and and we will we will tend to um, enlist the help of our partners to actually look at which areas can we add value and make it easier for you and your colleagues, and make it a better experience for customers without without actually having you know the opposite effect and and undermining or, or frustrating customers through through sort of duplication of effort. So you're right, it is a um, it is a fine balance. And going back to your your other point around brand and I guess what is in the recent years become termed performance marketing, I was uh, actually I hosted a, a workshop yesterday uh, for some Isbar members, and this was a big big point of discussion around how do you get that right balance between the right levels of awareness and consideration to push people through to the bottom of the funnel versus the best possible performance marketing CRO as you touched on towards the bottom of the funnel and it's interesting we probably got 
I mean, as you said, you're probably a marketeer that has historically invested more at the top of the funnel and has now improved and kind of enhanced its mid mid and bottom funnel funnel tactics. There are some, and I imagine there are some in your sector that are purely D to C online only delivery of lenses or whatever else that um, probably operate very much at that performance marketing level, maybe occasionally flirt with some above the line marketing, but they look for the customers that have got intent through search or are discovering through social as their means to, to grow their business. And the reality is well, a model that is purely top down and awareness consideration or a model that is too much at the bottom isn't going to create sustainable um, sustainable business. It's got to be somewhere in between. But how, how do you go about trying to find that right balance to work with your partners? Is it a combination of econometrics and analytics or is it is it modeling that your data teams do I'm, I'm just interested in how you try to work out the right balance um, in terms of your own investment yeah so uh, we um we we use a mix of econometrics through a through an agency partner and obviously um yeah. brand and comms and and customer tracking too um what's quite interesting in the debates that we will have about that as a department is um, I think the the context and the existing knowledge and thought and, and and sort of fact base that you already have, versus a conversation that will maybe be uh, you know five minutes out of a uh, of an eight hour board meeting or a com or, or a presentation yeah. you're doing to a thousand partners. So you know we we'll, we will we will often spend maybe half a half a day every uh, um, every six months or or every year sort of um, really chewing through the econometrics. You know none of that data. Uh, none of those conversations are really the same type of conversation you can have with your board colleagues and your partners. And so one of the things we've, yeah. we've been working really hard on is how you, how you story tell in a way that, um, in a way that gives, gives colleagues uh, and gives our stores that confidence that, we, that we're striking the right, um, the right balance. And I think a lot of that comes from um, looking, to, looking to other industries and looking to sort of objective um, objective observers as well and just sort of telling the the story of the, the the journey we've been on over the last sort of um 10 15 years to try and in, in, engender that confidence on on how we go about striking um striking the right balance but but certainly turning it into um i suppose board friendly or um sort yeah. of retail uh, friendly language uh, i think is where the is where the real um is where the real uh, where the real um where the real skill is yeah no i really like that and I really like the way, Chris, that you talk about the different stakeholders in the organization, um, whether it's the customers or your agency partners or the board or um, the partners in your stores. It feels like you're constantly thinking about how, how the marketing and e-commerce um, team is satisfying all of those uh, stakeholders, as well as obviously the end customer. 2,000 partners across the country, I mean, and indeed, other countries, Ireland and Spain, obviously different localities, different high streets um, have got very different, um, very different businesses, I guess, and some will be doing exceptionally well, particularly in this time, and some will be struggling. How important is it to get really hyper local when it comes to some of what you're doing with your advertising and your media? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a good question. So I think it was, uh, it was important last year. It's, it just couldn't, couldn't more important now and I think you know the conversations that we're having earlier around the importance or the or, or the or the benefits that performance and, and data-driven marketing can bring I guess this is where it can really really come into its um come into its own um you're right we've we've got real we've got we've got stores that are poles apart in terms of the um uh, in, in terms of the, the the demand that they're seeing at the moment and you know you read about in the national press people shopping more local market towns doing well yeah. um, you can imagine that that's not the case for our for our stores that are in zone one in in central London um, and so actually going hyper local and finding a way of actually being able to then deliver that at scale so we've got over 900 stores across across um, across the UK is 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 been critically important over the last um, the last six months and that's where actually being able to work with our with our media agencies and and and, and search partners and thinking as well around how we um utilize um uh, data and some of our um crm activity so that we can deliver a hyper local hyper local approach but at a but at a mass you know at a mass scale 
has become step. has become yeah. really really important and we've we've tended to look at sort of um segmenting our um our store base um by sort of key um by key sort of attributes um to um to, to, to try and make that a bit more manageable so a really good example of that would be the you know the percentage of customer base that a store has um that are commuters you know that that, that live that live more than a certain distance from the store and sure enough you start to see the stores you would expect bubbling towards the top of that list mm -hmm. the approach that we take with that cohort of stores is going to be very different to um um to those that are at the bottom of the list and that's that that sort of segmentation approach is how we've tried to um to oh, make make yeah. it manageable when you've effectively got 900 marketing plans that you could arguably be um be trying to create yeah 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 no it's uh it's interesting, isn't it? It's like there's so much that is now possible um, in terms of the tools or the targeting or the technology. Um, but as you say, you've got to find that right balance between the marginal gains and the, uh, the, the tactics versus the things that actually you can scale up because um, it's the, the only challenge with all of these new opportunities is that you then need more headcount and more specialist headcount to be able to actually uh, manage it all don't you because search versus social versus data versus crm versus programmatic they're, they're all quite specialist skills and you i guess you, part of your job is to is to work out as you said earlier where to spend time and where to encourage the team to focus and focus on one thing week rather than on 10 because you're unlikely to get 10 things done brilliantly that's it that's it and i think there are there are there are certain you know there, there are certain sort of silver bullets that come along that, that you know can benefit benefit a range of stores in in, in different ways so you know, a good example of that would be some work we did um a few months ago with our media agency man and gottlieb and, and with google around um automatically sort of weighting our um our advertising around stores where we knew there was good appointment availability over the course of the you know the next the next two weeks and investing time in something like that that we know is going to benefit you know, a range of stores across the country that have got the availability that can see customers rather than those that are maybe booked up because of obviously the, the pent up demand issues we have in certain parts of the country was a really good example of something that that was that was working at a hyper local level for those stores that really needed it, but actually was something that we could um, we could develop as a solution centrally with a relatively small team. Nice. Well, look, Chris, I really um, um, I really enjoyed the way that you've you've talked about all of the various um, kind of aspects and actually trying to work out what is where to spend time and where the priorities are and how to make sure that everyone from the board table through to the partners that are uh, dealing with customers coming through the doors um, are, are served properly. As we move towards the close, is there one thing that you personally um, would commit to doing more of in your organisation to make sure that marketing is delivering against that mission of growing the business, but also satisfying serving those various stakeholders? Yeah, I, th I think for, for me, it's it's that piece around hidden gains. So I think the the, the, the vast majority of what um, what our teams um, spend time on uh, are those marginal gains, particularly now we're moving into a, a world of interacting with our customers a lot more online. And I think that's something that is hidden from from our organisation, whether that's partners in store or or my colleagues around the board table. So actually bringing to light some of those stories around what we're doing with data or CRM or or some of our testing online that would just go unnoticed ordinarily. I think getting on the front foot with proactive communication around the value that those changes are delivering day in day out is is really important. Is something I need to I need to put some real time and commitment into over the over the coming weeks and months. Great. And is is that the piece of advice you'd give to other marketeers or is there anything else you'd leave listeners with uh, to think about? Um, I, I suppose the, the other thing just for other people to think about, I'm sure I'm sure everyone has gone through a similar sort of process, but we we kind of coined this um, sort of project around hindsight 2020 is what we called it internally. And it was basically looking back at the last six months um, and, mm. and taking and, and looking to take some of the learnings from, you know, what what worked well. Uh, and actually what kind of behaviors were exhibited over that over that period of sort of crisis that we actually now want to be able to be able to hold on to and how do we ensure that maybe some of the bad habits that went away uh, don't return and so I, I guess if there are people out there that maybe haven't gone through that sort of process haven't asked their teams 
um, what they felt worked and what didn't over the course of that uh, over that period. Uh, that's maybe a, a, a really good process to go through because we certainly found that actually there are things that we um, that we stopped doing and frankly we don't want to start again. Uh, and there were things that we stumbled yeah. upon that we really want to hold uh, um, hold on to. Uh, and I'll maybe just encourage people that maybe haven't gone through that process with their teams and their department to maybe do something similar and they'll probably get some uh, some good feedback come out of it. Excellent. That is a great place to leave things. Um, I'm also a big fan of the start, stop, continue. I think, I think often we're running so hard at doing things that you don't actually um stop to think about what worked and what didn't so chris look um, it's been a delight um really grateful for you making the time and uh thank you for giving the listeners so much insight into how you and specsavers approach the world of marketing no worries thanks a lot paul thanks a lot thank you for tuning into this latest podcast i hope you enjoyed it as much as i did uh, we'll be back again very soon interviewing a senior marketer and understanding what they would like to reset in the marketing industry In the meantime, if you want to check out me, uh, you can find me on Twitter, Paul underscore Framp, and you can find my new business, which is a hybrid marketing consultancy helping with in-housing, digital strategy, uh, and marketing attribution at controlvexposed.co.uk, on Twitter under CVE, or on LinkedIn under controlvexposed. Look forward to you coming back next time and having more interesting conversations. Thank you.